Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I want to welcome to the show Emily Kornheiser, one of three representatives for the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hello, Olga. And if you're new to the show, this is a place where we talk about how things in Montpelier shake out for Wyndham County and basically the rest of us. <laughs> and I have to applaud Emily and I today because despite, if you're watching us on YouTube, despite our crazy schedules, we still managed to send psychic memos to each other and be coordinated. If you're listening on the radio, know that we are both wearing perfectly beautiful teal shirts. Mm -hmm. And lovely jewelry. Mm -hmm. So see, even, even in crazy days, mm -hmm. there are small moments of synchronicity. <laughs> Emily, I would love to start with just um, a quick reminder to folks, if you are in Vermont, uh, Vermont is continuing to roll out the vaccine. Folks who are in their 30s now can um, schedule appointments. Is that correct, Emily? Yes, it is 30 plus. Anyone in the 30 plus age bracket can register as of today. Last week was 40 plus, And before that, it was 50 plus folks who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, Vermonters, and their households, not necessarily genetic households, just people they live with. Um, and then folks with certain high risk medical conditions. And so we are getting so close to the finish line. The very last bracket is going to be next week with the 16 plus. Wow. Yeah. And I received my vaccine last week. You're receiving it tomorrow. And so far for me, side effects have been kind of along line with every vaccine I've ever had. For so, me, most any side effect I could have would be a really good side effect, and I'm looking forward to it. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I've, folks can sign up on the Department of Health website, or they can sign up through one of the chain pharmacies. I went with the Department of Health website because me too. I love my state government institutions, um, but I've heard people have some really good success. Um, and if you don't get an appointment right away, you can schedule one that's further out and then look for a sooner one if that's something that feels really hot for you. There's been a lot of um, good social media generation X jokes about those of us who used to buy concert tickets on the phone by calling over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. And how we're well prepared for these moments in our history. Might be the only piece of history that we're well prepared for. And I have found with the vaccine, talking about side effects, when I talk to friends who have gotten it already, the biggest side effect has been this crazy, amazing sense of relief. Yeah. Just like the tension in the world has just sort of dropped a little bit. So I'm looking for, I hope you have that side effect too, Emily. Too. And enjoy I have to it. Be, I am looking forward to that. Um, I'm really excited that I finally understand what the point of those weird shirts that were in style a couple of years ago that have no shoulders. I've, they ma made no sense to me at the time and now they finally make sense. I don't own one because I think they're fairly awkward but it turns out that they have a use. I know Dolly Parton wore one. I don't know if anyone else saw that incredible video she made. Um, I am very excited. I'm hoping I have that feeling of relief. I will also admit that I have a certain degree of like social reemergence anxiety. And I know I'm not alone, so I wanna talk about it out, out loud as much as, as much as I can. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure what real life looks like anymore. And I am just nervous about the newness of whatever comes next. And, yeah. and as we've talked about before, there's, um, you know, there was a really strong hope and a really strong sense that we would come out of this um, like butterflies who had learned valuable lessons. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm ready to cross the threshold and say, oh, look, this is what we learned and here we are. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't feel like quite enough yet. Yeah, I, I think- Quite enough we... suffering, but not quite enough <laughs> lessons. Yeah, not quite enough time to even process mm -hmm. what we've been through. Um, which is usually when the learning kicks in. 
I, I think we need to acknowledge in the middle of all this excitement that this pandemic has not been the same for everyone. And for some of us who might be getting ready to reemerge as little butterflies, as you said, and start the recovery period, there are, we need to acknowledge that there are probably some people who are still in crisis. Mm -hmm. And that recovery is going to be very uneven. And I'm curious, uh, Emily, for you, at the legislature, has there been any conversation about how do we still protect people who maybe because of family reasons or health reasons can't re-enter society mm -hmm. when everyone else does? Maybe they still need to keep working remotely, for example. Has there been conversations around that? We've talked at length about a few pieces of that. Um, we've talked about, I've spent a lot of time talking about sort of the K-shaped recovery and what it means um, to acknowledge that some of us became wealthier through this time and some of us became poorer um, and what that means for sort of our future economic development and um, economic support systems and tax structure. There's the piece that I think we've been talking about since the beginning of having sort of eviction moratoriums and utility shutoff moratoriums and that the other side of that can't be a cliff. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that there are really dollars attached to that. And when we talk about in, in a few minutes, the American Rescue Plan money, um, I think that'll be a good opportunity to dive into that. And then have talked at length, of course, about the child care crisis and how that pairs with the unemployment crisis. And I think we're doing a good job investing in that. Um, there's a bill that just came over from the Senate that provides dependent care benefits for folks on unemployment, which is very exciting. And it's a really um, pretty serious acknowledgement of the state that we find ourselves in um, and people being able to stay on unemployment um, if they, you know, for health reasons or childcare reasons, um, can't work due to the pandemic. And that was a real part of the whole, um, that was the part of the unemployment system from the beginning of the pandemic. And I don't know if, you know, listeners heard those conversations that we had about it, but we really used our unemployment system here in Vermont as a, you know, family medical leave system as a social safety net. And in, administratively, it often failed at that task. Um, but in terms of statute, we really built in a lot of flexibility around reasons that someone was permitted to leave a job and still be eligible for unemployment. And so that's not going away um, anytime soon. Thank you. But it is, I, you know, for those folks, either those folks who have been working through this entire period and desperately need to rest and um, don't see one in sight, don't see a spot for rest in sight, or folks who are still in a really medically vulnerable situation, I'm, I imagine it's really terrifying to see the speed of the reopening that the governor has put in place. I mean, I'm nervous about it and I, um, personally don't have a strong reason to be. It, you know, we are doing some really drastic reopening before everyone is fully vaccinated, before we even have a vaccine for children at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, for those who don't know, the, the governor's reopening plan basically targets July 4th as, as reopening and and can I just say, like, I get, like, you know, politics in America and the flag. Mm -hmm. It's just a little too much for me. It's just a little too much. If I, I looked at that date and I thought, well, that's wonderful. Yes, more people have been vaccinated and we are going to see so many COVID numbers spike after that date. That was my response. <laughs> for my better response for was like, is this patriotism? Is this, I don't know. See, I, I, my other response was, oh, this is tourism. This yeah. is Vermont playing into its tourist identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, things are not, things are not going to be magically easy for everyone. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to be smooth coming out of this. No. Yeah. Um, which is why we need to keep having conversations like this.
and keep them at the front burner. I, before we talk about the recovery funds, I want to just quickly touch base with you, Emily, about something that's been moving through the legislature, or at least the, the Appropriations Committee. It's not really have a lot of legs, but I think is worth us touching on. And that's the conversation the Appropriations Committee recently had about the possibility of a universal basic income, mm -hmm. which for those who don't know is basically a chunk of money that's given to individuals and it's just given to them. They're like, the government says you spend this however you need to spend it. Mm -hmm. um, and other communities have tried this. I believe Stockton, California uh, has finished like a two year pilot or something about that. Uh, Finland has tried this. Um, a few other countries have tried this. A few regions of Spain have, a few regions of mm -hmm. Italy. Um, yeah, it's a pretty long-standing and interesting and um, yeah. And so I'm wondering for Vermont, where are we with that conversation? You know, um, we're not very far with that mm -hmm. conversation, but um, you know, we just voted to decriminalize buprenorphine on Thursday. Which is pretty huge. Which is really huge and um, more than, you know, represents for me the opportunity for a lot of lives saved in the future and all kinds of other things that we've talked about in the context of harm reduction and opiates before. But what it also represents to me is the actual speed that of change that people are capable of. Um, Good and point. so I don't want to say like, it's just the beginning of a conversation. It'll be two decades before we ever get anywhere because that's not, you know, sometimes we are capable of thinking faster than that. So where we are in the conversation right now, is the chair of the appropriations committee wants to study the issue. Um, and there are a few dynamics in there. So, and what she was saying, and what I think is a really important point to make is that we spend an enormous amount of money on social supports in this state, so much money, and they don't work. Mm -hmm. They barely keep people from starving. We know that there are still parents going without meals so that their kids can eat. We know that the chronic stress of poverty weighs on everyone in the family um, and has severe health side effects as well as social emotional side effects. Um, we know that the particular kind of poverty that we maintain, like the incredibly, um, how little money someone who's sort of being subsidized in poverty gets it's really, really, really impossible to take any steps out of that. And that's something that we talked about with Deb Brighton when she came in to talk about the um, tax commission report. And so I think what the appropriations committee is talking about is what if we spent all of that money and just gave it to people to do, to live their lives with, which is from my perspective, also a similar thing that we're doing with buprenorphine. We're saying like, we trust you to figure out your own journey through, mm -hmm. you know, through whatever you're doing with your body. Um, and that's really exciting to me. The idea of trusting Vermonters mm -hmm. feels really good. Um, the idea of not being gatekeepers of someone else's survival, mm -hmm. that feels really good. Um, and that, you know, the moral judgments that come with poverty are so deep and thick and terrible and moving to a universal basic income would relieve us of so much of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so many of the stories we tell about why someone would or wouldn't have money. We would also, depending on how we set up the system for a universal basic income, the relief I feel is you and I talk about systems so much and how much energy they can take and how much energy it can take for someone who's trying to access these programs needs to expand to, to get the benefits. And to me, this just seems like such a much simpler way to get people resources and just free up so much of their time and energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it could, you know, it could save money for the state. It could, um, would definitely save time and energy and money for the individuals who are receiving it. There are a lot of other sort of pieces to consider in it though. Um, 
So, you know, all of the ethical, moral conversations aside, of which I'm sure many people have many opinions about, um, there's also the fact that a lot of our social safety net funding comes in the form of block grants that are very, very strictly um, controlled. Yeah. So our TANF money, our food stamp money, all of that, it's incredibly unflexible. I'm looking right now at how we can um, put money into our food stamp budget in order to have food stamps be a allowable vehicle for purchasing menstrual products. Um, and that is like hurdle yes. upon hurdle. <laughs> and I'm not even saying using federal funds. I'm saying like put state funds onto people's food stamp cards. So there's that, um, that we couldn't necessarily just sort of take that money and turn it into UBI without really significant negotiations with the feds mm. and them changing these rules really significantly. Um, there's some sort of theoretical studies around UBI. Um, a lot of the really big picture returns come from what happens when a whole community is experiencing it, not when just people in poverty are experiencing it. Um, mm -hmm. The way it frees people um, at most income levels to volunteer more, to take care of their neighbors more, to show, you know, to just have more time and space and creativity. Um, you know, there's a lot of assumptions around built into those conversations around people making more art, um, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so that piece of it and the temporary nature of it um, is often left out of studies and pilots. Hmm. Um, because one, the relief that comes from knowing that this is gonna be there for five years is very different than the relief if you're part of a test group and it's a year, right? You make very different choices in those two mm -hmm. scenarios. Yeah. Um, if I even knew I had like an inheritance coming in 10 years, I might make very different decisions today than I would, you know. Um, so I think that's also a really big piece around the way we understand the returns in a system like this versus what like little tiny studies do. But even mm -hmm. little tiny studies that are just delivering this to folks who are living in poverty see incredible returns. So I think it's a good idea no matter what. I think it's an even better idea when you do it for like a whole decade and it goes to everyone in your whole state. But if all we have is like switching from incredibly restrictive, basically carceral state welfare benefits to this, I'm all in. Yes. You know, the five-year study is, is a really good point because when you think about it, I think about um, every time my income's been tight, there's always, you kind of fall behind on certain things like your credit card debt builds or your student loan debt builds just because you're not keeping up with payments for say, for example. Yeah. And so when you first get a, a, a chunk of money, it goes to catching you up. Mm -hmm. And so you almost need enough time for people to catch up and then move forward. And then um, know that it's gonna be there in the future so that they don't have to hoard. Right. Or so that they can really be making long-term strategic, strategic decisions. If you know it's gonna be there for five years, maybe you'll go get your master's degree, but if it was only gonna be there for three years, you might not, mm -hmm. right? Good point, good point. Um, we have just about 10 minutes before we, go to break. So we want to talk about the American Rescue Plan Act or what everyone's calling ARPA. So before we go to break, Emily, um, I have a presentation from the, the governor's plan. Mm. And according to this plan, um, Vermont is set to receive at least 2.7 billion through this package. Mm -hmm. And leaving, and some of that money is already determined to go places, leaving approximately 1 billion for the state to expend over the next four years. Yeah, before we jump into sort of what the state will expend, I think mm -hmm. it's helpful given we just talked about universal basic income and things like that, I think it's helpful to talk about the parts that are going um, not to the state. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so about a billion of that $3 billion goes to Vermonters directly. Okay. Um, and that includes a 30% increase in the earned income tax credit, the federal earned income tax credit. 
that the first ten thousand dollars of folks unemployment insurance was not federal was not taxable federally and um, likely won't be taxable in Vermont. Um, and then this really significant child care tax credit that's going to be paid out monthly um, at $250 or $300 a month for folks with children, depending on the age of the children. So that's like, those are, and then there's also the um, individual checks that came out, the, you know, $1,400 or $2,800. Um, and I think those are hitting people's bank account, you know, I got my check a few weeks ago. My partner actually got his direct deposited yesterday. So mm -hmm. by my very limited sample, those seem to be floating in. Um, and then the unemployment supplement and a huge amount of increased funds for SNAP, that's food stamps and LIHE, that's fuel subsidy. So, and then the other thing, and then um, there's a bunch of changes to health insurance um, and health insurance credits that should significantly lower um, premiums for oh. folks. So that's really exciting. That's super exciting. And so, you know, I'm sure everyone's seen the headlines already, but really like when you pile all of those pieces up, it's the most significant anti-poverty federal package we've seen in decades and decades and decades. Um, and really makes a difference for families like really up to $100,000 a year in income. Mm -hmm. So that's half of the money. Um, and that's great. Mm -hmm. That's just great. And so that money, in addition to making all of us breathe a little bit more easily um, and be able to make maybe some different decisions, um, also is money that we're going to spend. Because people who, you know, middle class and poor folks spend their money. Yes, they do. They buy groceries and gas uh -huh. and pay rent and oh. mortgages and yeah. yeah. And sometimes they even buy lawn furniture. I've seen, you know, on Facebook, it seems like people are buying a lot of lawn furniture lately. <laughs> and know. bicycles. And bicycles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but spend it and spend it often locally. And even if you don't spend your money locally, we have sort of, and you're buying things online from whatever corporation you're buying them from, you actually still are paying local sales tax on those. And so all of that spending we're doing also brings more money into Vermont that then circulates, which is sort of the, you know, um, positive feedback loop that a lot of um, more progressive financial and economic policies um, really depend on that feedback loop. So that's, that bodes well, not just for each of us, like this month, it also that we're probably going to be seeing a positive growth curve from this even one time infusion for at least a year or two. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. And then there's a huge amount of money that goes directly to school districts that yes. doesn't go through the agency of education. Which is oh, it's not important. going through the agency of education. I mean, I think the agency of education like has to wire it mm -hmm. but they have no control over where it goes it's, so it's more on, of a pass through it's a pass through and it's based mm -hmm. on a formula that is federally determined interesting okay yeah. and so school districts get to make some really dynamic decisions some of them receiving money that's you know a significant portion of their usual budget mm -hmm. yeah peter congressman peter welch um visited the Brattleboro Select Board's meeting last week and he quoted a number of more than 9 million yeah. for the local school district, which yeah. is pretty significant, beyond significant. Yes, and so, but it's one-time money. Right. And so really, really interesting to see. It's a, both an incredible opportunity to, for schools to invest in things they might have been wanting to invest in for decades and decades. And this is an opportunity to really understand what schools do when they have that sense of plenty. Mm -hmm. um, when they're, you know, moving out of scarcity and into abundance, what are the decisions they make? What happens for children? What, you know, what does learning look like? All of those things. And so it's a real opportunity for us as legislators to study the issue. Right. And uh -huh. so we've been having a lot of conversations, you know, about weights and tax burdens and categorical grants. And 
this is a real opportunity for us to say, okay, these schools have all of this money. How do they behave? What are they prioritizing? What do they value? Um, and so that's going to be a really fun opportunity. And that's very similar to this incredible flood of money that's going directly to towns that, again, mm -hmm. the legislature has no control over. Um, and so, unfortunately, I don't have right in front of me how much money Brattleboro is getting. Maybe you I, do. Welch said uh, 3.3 million, I believe. Yeah, that looks about right. Yep. When I look at the towns, the towns I do have in front of me. And um, they're not getting it all at once. They're going to get it. That's the total. They'll get it in a few chunks. Yeah, over a few years. And so they don't have to spend it right away, which is huge compared mm -hmm. to the last round of federal money that we had to spend so fast we can be very strategic with. Um, and so we're putting in place legislatively a bunch of technical assistance for both schools and towns. Smart. To say, like, especially, I mean, Brattleboro has, like, planning divisions and capacity and the magical Peter Elwell and all kinds of things that we have to really help us make really and a great select board to help us make really strategic decisions and have done a lot of long-term planning work already. Um, a lot of other communities have much, much smaller leadership bodies and much less staff. And so putting in place this technical assistance to help communities think through these decisions strategically and carefully and making sure they're making the most of their money while leaving the decisions up to them. Again, a really poignant moment for us to understand these stories we tell about how different each of our communities are and um, see how they see how they behave when the rubber hits the road and they actually do have some of the control and agency that they've been looking for. So that'll be really, both really fun and just like an incredible leap forward for Vermont, you know? Mm -hmm. We're just about to go to break, but I don't want to drop that thread of this opportunity. Has the legislature given any thought to how it's going to collect this data and these stories? No, of course not. <laughs> That's not fair. There might be people in other committees that I just have not heard them having those conversations. I just know I've been really, you know, focused on this technical assistance idea and um, hoping that there's going to be really good reports connected to that technical assistance, con technical assistance contract. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us at the Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page, the Montpelier Happy Hour .captivate .fm webpage, as well as Emily Kornheiser's pages at emilykornheiser.org. Did I get that right? You did. Hey, mm -hmm. that feels like such an achievement. <laughs> no, <right. laughs> well, we can't assume that everyone's a regular listener, right? Well, of course not. And for folks who might not be regular listeners, the views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the host and the guests and not of the radio station, TV station, social media channel, et cetera. Et cetera. And for those who are just joining us and are on the radio, we want you to know that Olga and I are both wearing the same colored shirt today and we're pretty excited about it. Maybe we'll start coordinating in the future. Yes, why not? why not? Actually, I'm really loving because these past few weeks have just been such a whirlwind, showing up and we're both wearing the same colored shirt. It just felt like this moment of serenity. Yeah, especially like, since yes. we're wearing like, you know, sort of a serene tropical ocean blue color. Tells you what we both needed today. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Emily, thank you for that rundown before the break on all the ways money from this, the recent American Rescue Plan uh, is going to make it directly to people and communities. But there's also conversations at the state level with how the state might divvy, divvy up what its little pot of money. And the governor has released a plan. I believe he released it on April, or at least it came to lawmakers on the 6th. And that's that's what the 
the sure. date on okay. the paper says. We'll go with that. <laughs> and he's kind of looking broadly at um, what he's calling five major buckets, which is economic development, climate change, water sewer infrastructure, housing, broadband, telecom. And it's interesting. I had a conversation over the weekend with Senator Becca Ballin. And when I looked at these buckets, I thought, oh, this sounds good. Like if we want our communities to have, to grow, a lot of the rural, more rural communities need say water and sewer infrastructure to do that. So it's kind of exciting to see it here. And of course we've talked about broadband, but Becca brought up an interesting point from her perspective that she, she feels looking at some of these plans that they're going into very kind of brick and mortar um, projects rather than say things that might help people long term. I'm wondering, are you seeing something like that, or what's your response? Oh, that Senator Ballin stole my talking point. Um, oh no! Yeah, I think that one of the most exciting sort of mental shifts that some of us have been able to make over the last few years is when we think about infrastructure, we don't just think about physical infrastructure, we think about social infrastructure and how important that is. And the governor's plan really left out the people. Mm -hmm. However, um, the legislature is not dependent on the governor's plan and hasn't actually been waiting for the governor's plan. So <laughs> we... <laughs> um, surprise, surprise. I know the governor was getting sort of frustrated that we were doing things before we got his plan, but such as the branches of the government. So, well, I think this is a point we, we should make very clear to listeners that even though there is a plan and it is very nicely typed out and many pages thick, it is a plan and not set in stone. And what the legislature is working on is a plan not set in stone yet. Yeah, so. and so one of the, um, let's see, one of the funny things about all of this glorious COVID money that's been coming to us is that it um, is figuring out ways it fits into our regular decision-making cycle and process. Mm -hmm. So the last COVID round of COVID relief um, lined up from under the Trump administration, lined up fairly well with our delayed budgeting process because we had already delayed our budget, our annual budget process because of tax things, right. because taxes were delayed during the pandemic and there was a pandemic. That was new. So um, just that sort of, like that. They they so because of that, the two streams of money were able to um, merge together fairly easily. Mm -hmm. This year, we um, have our regular budget process, but before we even did our, put out a bill for a regular budget, we had extra CRF money from before December before January. And we had a little bit of new extra money from a bill that passed in December. And so we actually put out a um, pre-budget spending bill, which we don't ever do. And so that bill, the number is 315, and it passed mm -hmm. the House really early in the session, I think like maybe just three weeks in, it mm -hmm. went over to the Senate. Once it got to the Senate, we already knew the shape of this American Rescue Plan money. And so the Senate actually add in, added in some of the American Rescue Plan money into this 315 bill. And then it came back to the House. And then by then we had even more information. We added in a little bit more. And that's sitting on the governor's desk today for signature. So very similar process is happening with the budget. When the governor drafted, usually the governor drafts a budget, gives it to the legislature, the House reviews it, changes it, passes it to the Senate, who reviews it, changes it comes back to the house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the budget this year, the governor gave it to the legislature in early January before we had the American Rescue Plan. The house reviewed it, was aware of some of the shape of the American Rescue Plan, but it hadn't been, the guidelines hadn't been fully released yet. So we were able to have some surety on some sections of the billion dollars and put some of it into just a regular budget for the year. Um, and then it went, it is now over in the Senate where likely they're going to weave in the rest of the American Rescue Plan money into just our regular budget for the year, doubling our budget for the year, which is basically what we did last year with the um, 
money that came through the Trump COVID plan. And so, um, just got a we, little startled by someone it. entering my workspace, <laughs> um, mostly because of a funny thing that I, you know, heard about a friend yes. who had something like that happen to them earlier today, and now I'm all amused by it all. So, excuse me, I will regather myself. Anyway, um, so all of those um, funding streams have actually are lining up fairly well, and mean that. Um, and the governor, when he sort of released his American Rescue Plan plan, did not braid it with his budget that he had previously sent out. They're sort of separate, but mm -hmm. we've been treating them as the same. Like these are our big, because we also have way more revenue than we usually do. So we've been thinking much bigger through our budgeting process than we ordinarily would. So what we're looking at investing in is people and places because social infrastructure is physical infrastructure is infrastructure. So yes, huge investments in broadband, but also huge investments in childcare, um, growing the unemployment insurance pot like we talked about, um, continuing to do really significant work around racial justice reform, um, investing significantly in housing, which is, that's one place where we're lining up with the governor's plan quite well. Yeah. Um, and really investing in not just in homeless services housing, but investing in sort of housing infrastructure in a few different places in the ecosystem there. Um, continuing to invest in the environment, clean energy. I think, you know, historically we have a lot of differences between the legislature and the governor on what it means to invest in climate. Um, and what sort of the best, you know, I think the governor tends to not, um, wants to invest in technology mm -hmm. as sort of the solution. And I think we um, see some of that being useful, but we also need to um, really invest in some changes and how we make, you know, our day-to-day -day lives in order to do that. And that's, in some ways, that sometimes it's more social infrastructure than physical infrastructure. So mm -hmm. there are places where I think we're in pretty broad agreement, um, but there's places where there's difference. And on the wastewater piece, which I think is a big part of the governor's plan, we really feel like municipalities right now have a lot of what they need to take those steps um, mm. because there is all this money going to municipalities. And so we don't want to confuse the issue too much by um, competing with whatever conversations communities are having amongst themselves with that. Interesting, okay. Um. I'm just looking while you were talking, trying to look through housing. And I do believe the governor is proposing 249 million mm -hmm. to put towards different housing initiatives yeah. um, just to put in. And for water sewer infrastructure, he's proposing 170 million mm -hmm. um, for those projects. And so the other piece of the ARPA money that I'd like to highlight for folks um, who might not know is we, um, a lot of the money that came directly to the state, not the direct to people money and not the direct to towns or schools money, all has a number of restrictions around it. And so I think that's mm -hmm. really helpful to say too, because it's a billion dollars, but a lot of it needs to go to very specific places. So um, a whole lot of it needs to go directly to child care stabilization and child care block grants. Mm -hmm. um, a huge bucket of it needs to go towards LIHEAP, which mm -hmm. is the fuel assistance money. Yep. Um, there's significant money right now for folks who are behind on rent. Right. And behind on utilities. That was just a new program that was sort of relaunched with new specifications. Mm -hmm. But that new federal bucket of money doesn't have money for people who are behind on their mortgages. Oh. Vermont has one of the highest rates of home ownership in the country, mostly because we're so white. But it means that we have um, different needs around sort of where financial aid for something like that goes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we're going to really need, if we want to keep people housed who are experiencing financial stress, we need to have that rental assistance money. But we also need to have mortgage assistance money and lot rent money. Um, uh, for yes. Um, folks who are in manufactured homes. Yeah. So that's something we need to spend sort of the state side of the money on. And then 
the other, you know, really deeply human piece of this is the supportive services, the mental health support, the case management support. We have so many people going through such significant stressful transitions right now who um, have really been left out of systems for the last year. And mm -hmm. so that's really a significant place that investment is needed. Okay. I just want to remind folks that about the rental assistance program, if you're in Windor, Wyndham County and you need help with rents or um, utilities, you can reach out to SEVCA or you can also call 211 and they can direct you to the program if this is, if this is something you need help with. And if all of that feels a little too personal and intimate, you can go to the Vermont State Housing Authority website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this rental assistance program and utilities has been expanded as well. So it's covering more people or, it, or utilities. It is expanded and contracted simultaneously. It's just ah. than the last one. So, okay. um, so don't cover, assume you will or will not qualify not before assume you, will you reach will out. Qualify. There's a lot more money available to each individual person who's looking for money. Mm -hmm. and utilities can be included in it and a very expanded definition of utilities okay. um, including heat for instance um, and then the restrictions around whether you need to be a tenant or a landlord and the agreements you need to come to to apply are much looser this time around um, mm. which I think people are really happy about on all sides of the aisle um, given that our eviction moratorium is still in effect thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's that. Um, the part about needing to be um, impacted by COVID and your financial situation to be about being impacted by COVID is, much, is a little bit stricter than it was with the first round. Hmm. Um, so folks who are poor and struggling before and are now just as poor and struggling um, might not be as eligible as they were with the last round. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. I think we should stick a little pin on that and maybe come back to it. Because when, when you just said that comment, my first gut reaction was, yes, we had problems going into COVID, but how is anybody not impacted by COVID right now? Yes. So how could that even have restrictions on it, I guess, is and my that, gut reaction. Um, yeah. And so the Vermont legislature has no control over that at all. That is like straight federal design. Mm -hmm. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to broadband. Mm -hmm. The governor is proposing 250.5 million. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, you said some interesting points about water and sewer infrastructure and what towns mm -hmm. have access to for funding right now. With towns work around CUDs, mm -hmm. communications- um, Union districts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling that the money the governor wants to put to broadband is going to be useful or should that money be used a different way? So we, had, we have really significant spending for broadband in the budget that just left the house and went to the Senate. Um, and that's a, you know, we want to make sure that communication union districts that are ready to get going have the money that they need. We also know that there's another infrastructure package coming from the federal government very soon. And that a lot of communication union districts aren't ready to go yet. And so want to make sure that we're using, you always want to use the least restrictive money for the things that you know have the, that match up the best i'm not explaining this very well but you know you want if you have money that's restrictive you want to make sure that you're not using unrestricted money for something that you could use restricted money for yes. and so that's part of what i think we're trying to balance as we move forward with spending this bucket of money on infrastructure on physical infrastructure knowing that another infrastructure package is on its way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have so many Vermonters who, you know, are just trying to make it work. Right. Right. Yeah. 
talk to me about this, I call it a, a, a conversation loop, meaning it's something that kind of keeps coming back into conversations around this money. And that is the governor saying, we have to be careful that we don't spend this money on one time on programs, mm. this one time mm. money on programs. And, you, you know, talk to me about that. Is that a real concern? Is that, what's your perspective on that? You know, nonprofits and actually state government, you know, a lot of state government has is funded by national grants. So, you know, I worked in one of the positions I've had in state government was under a five-year grant from the feds. And so people are accustomed to doing stuff, knowing that the money in the future is not guaranteed for them. Um, and so if we have money right now to make sure that every Vermont kid has free school lunch, I think we should do it and see what we learn and how much that improves people's lives for the five years we have the money. Mm -hmm. And then deal with what happens on the other side of that um, and solve problems from there. I, so yes or no, but there's also, you know, I'm, I think it's really important to be conscious of a tail versus a cliff. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to be thinking about how we can shape our revenue in the future to match up what needs we are now identifying and meeting. Um, I think we've all talked for a very long time, even the governor, in how much money we save when we invest in upstream solutions and how often very expensive it is to start doing that because you need to be paying for the upstream and the downstream simultaneously while you're waiting for the upstream to pay off and lower the cost of the downstream. So right now, we have a real opportunity to invest in both simultaneously, knowing or assuming or hoping that that would actually save us money in the long run. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can invest in ongoing things, knowing that it will still save us money in the long term, knowing that mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we'll have an exact matching liability down the road. Um, but these are not sort of like, you know, your standard principles of like, you know, perfect accounting. Um, Vermont is not required to have a balanced budget in statute, however we always have. Um, and I do think that sometimes having conversations like that allows us to be sort of the creative, like it's one time money, we should be creative with it. And so that's really nice and exciting. I just don't want it to keep us captive. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I have struggled with with a lot of these plans, regardless of whether it's coming from the governor or I'm hearing members of the legislature talk about it, mm -hmm. is we, are our, our world has been turned upside down and shaken out and we're playing pickup sticks. And we so, that. we're looking for our entering our new normal, but how much of the old normal do we wanna bring with us? And I would say there's a lot we don't want to bring with us. Yes. And sometimes I, I look at some of these suggestions, again, whether it's from the governor or someone else, and I, I still see a lot of old normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that kind of worries me. Yeah. Me too. It's why I'm scared to get my vaccine, actually. And reopen the Vermont, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear that. Mm -hmm. We're almost out of time. What, what is the legislature's next step around some of these plans? Because we are getting near to the end of the session or the traditional end of the ses session. Yeah, I haven't had anyone warn me yet that the session's not gonna end in May. Okay. I don't know if that means it's not. I don't really, you know, who knows, time lost it a while ago. Um, so like I said, it's going to be most likely most of it's going to be in the budget. Okay. Um, and so some of it was put into the House budget that we passed out and is now sitting in the Senate and the Senate will, you know, integrate further. Mm -hmm. And we'll go from there. It's likely not going to be a separate spending package. So there might be sort of a tag on. Um, and we're going to figure that out as we go. And, you know, 
are having conversations about if this infrastructure package comes the week we're supposed to be closing up shop, how do we make decisions in our absence? Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that even after the legislature gavels out, they might come back for a special session? There's a chance of anything in this life, Olga. <laughs> yes, but how big a chance? I don't know. I'm not, I honestly have no idea. I'm not, I, I'm not trying to be like adorably coy with a journalist. I really just don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> we do our traditional mechanism for these kinds of decisions when the legislature is not in session as the Joint Fiscal Committee. And I okay. sit on there and I would be happy to make all these decisions. That sounds like fun. Um, but it's not usually this much money that we're talking about. So we'll see. Okay. So big funding package, big conversations, big decisions. And unfortunately, we are near the end of the show. So Emily, what should we toast to this? So our vaccines. Yay, vaccines. Yay, vaccines. Thanks and for yay. medicine. And to all the healthcare professionals who are making sure that these vaccines are given well and efficiently and that people sit for 15 minutes afterwards and are well cared for. Cheers to them as well. Cheers. <laughs> the Montpelier Happy Hour can be found on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro every Friday at 2 p.m. as well as online. And Emily, where can folks find you as well? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org where you can have access to all of my social media channels, my newsletter, and um, what's the last thing? Email address, phone number, as well as my weekly community conversations that happen every Sunday at 11 a.m. on the Zooms. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.